Hello guys, around a year ago, well it doesn't show what exact date that was, we can only guess it was like uh, maybe late November or maybe first half of December, something like this. I've posted uh, a question uh, for my subscribers and uh, it was like financial reset is planning planning to happen pretty much soon so I thought I could ask you guys if you are interested to know about how and when and I've posted the screenshot shot from uh, one website a um, little bit later maybe it was 3rd of uh, January I recorded a video with the explanation well, it was like Christmas and uh, New Year, so didn't have much time to record it earlier. But anyways, that also um, was a time when uh, we had a, a warning from all the liberal media that the uh, Third World War is going to start very soon. Because you, if you remember... Um, in the end of December there was a crisis with Iran and the Suleimani event and many more cases to happen so so I combined two, two, two of those messages in one video and uh, talked about financial reset and um, all these situation that's gonna be unfolding in 2020 uh, and so there's a short uh, clip me mentioning this in my videos hey guys trying to make a video on what I uh, pr promise you in my community um, the information about the financial reset that was planning to happen pretty much soon what I'm trying to say is nothing's gonna happen in 24 nothing major except maybe the start of financial the reset so um, and that's what I was trying to say when I was posting this uh, comment here probably should have been waiting for more stuff to happen to make the story more clear and uh, support with more facts but I think that's uh, pretty much enough to uh, claim that uh, in my opinion should be considered as a prediction for the next few uh, years so uh, when I said nothing major I I'm actually meant uh, that there will be no war uh, no major war uh, except that financial crisis so financial reset so um, and I was talking about the gold prices if you rewatch the whole video I don't want to bore you with these stats and stuff like this but anyways um, the prediction was made let's say in December 2019 so it was like uh, around uh, 1600 per ounce of uh, US dollars per uh, gold and uh, right now we see that uh, really the price was skyrocketing to 2000 and right now it's around uh, 1900 dollars uh, per ounce so that prediction uh, kind of worked actually these stocks had a reset as you know so shortly after my prediction uh, let's say in January when the video was released on 3rd of January, 4th January, I don't remember. Uh, you see the huge drop in uh, for two months. Uh, three three huge bars of sales. So it was a huge sell. As you can see, it's uh, one of the biggest drops. Probably the biggest drop in the, in the current history. On both on Dow Jones and S&P features. Uh, futures had the same decline and right now they all skyrocketed to the highs just because the dollar dollar itself was devaluated by a couple of trillions of dollars that were flushed into the economy and during this year both in uh, in US and uh, in Europe and many more countries by the way so uh, the what this drop does mean is that actually means that we all lost around 20% of our wealth everybody not only the stockholders uh, not only those shareholders of big companies but everybody 
and an average drop of GDP doesn't actually mean anything because uh, we can only witness the the, the prices and uh, stuff around us and uh, so the, the wealth declined the real estate also is in a huge question so um, that is actually financial reset and uh, it's not over the year is not over we, we, we might see something really strange till the end of the year and uh, in my opinion the year was gonna end in February this year because it's gonna be long long 2020 and so uh, sometimes the year just don't end in the next year so it is it's really strange to explain but well we all lost during this year everybody knows that so financial reset prediction actually worked and uh, the word itself reset the reset word that I was using way back from 2016 2017 2018 I was using it to describe the technology of resetting and so on so um, there was a chat me and Lawrence Wright and and Lori Freire we were talking about the math lot uh, way back in 2016 on her channel that's where I first started to appear on YouTube as a as a person as a channel because I only work on YouTube but not actually talk on YouTube and as you know I only talk on uh, and broadcast on English uh, segment of YouTube so whatever they were talking about new cities uh, and the reset and the stuff like this and um, they were talking about it in 2018 in September and I made a re reaction video also saying uh, you know um, shouting out to their channel and uh, what they were talking about and so the reset itself and my videos that were made before about empty cities kind of correlated with what they were talking about about empty cities in China and so on and uh, and that was 2018 guys and remember the all these empty cities that we had in March and April and so on so where you could also film pictures like this and I don't know was it on purpose or was it just a coincidence but somebody started using this CV19 uh, case as a reset also and uh, but I was also saying just that, that this is just uh, the collateral jam damage I don't know this is the the this stuff that were just marking who is playing with us and uh, the, the word crown and uh, corona is pretty much the same so um, and also these Kobe Bryant cases and many more hints that were showing and decrypting that who is behind all this stuff today I wanted to you know c collect all this information on Great Reset uh, that was actually hyping during this year and especially in, uh, in during the fall when the World Economic Forum in Davos claimed the Great Reset strategy and stuff like this and so this is kind of correlates with what we were talking back in the days because I was saying that re this is how they call it they call it the reset and uh, that's why I use this term just because of that because I know how they call it and uh, it definitely means uh, you know creating the situation to start over to you know bring new people to the area I mean flood and flood the area with new people uh, replace the old ones uh, you know get rid of all these expenses and stuff like this and all these and un unuseful uh, per per persons and uh, and people who are you know they don't actually um, cannot be implemented in the new order of uh, after the reset times and so on so and the rest are just getting brain brainwashed and um, this is how they you know shift shift and uh, magnify the the emergence of, uh, of of this civilization because we are the leftovers of the previous civilization they're not telling us about it they're not telling us about the technologies the previous civilizations had and they only can tell us uh, different edited stories and uh, a bunch of brainwashed people think they are really doing scientific job and a bunch of debunkers and fact checkers help them to to you know to dominate in the search results and stuff like this and uh, 
uh, troll us with comments and videos kind of debunking stuff and maybe sometimes they're right and the critics are correct but I'm not talking about everyone who is you know, opposing any of those series the reset mud flood and and so on I'm talking about people who just you know trying to read Wikipedia Wikipedia and uh, trying to debunk us with basement explanations or and stuff like this so well, whatever let's roll over the reset and their plans and what are they planning to do in the financial and social sectors of our lives and this great reset strategy because everybody was trying to talk about it but not everybody understands the narrative that was before and the historical well some people actually use historical uh historical flashbacks to compare and uh, try to, to you know predict what's gonna happen and how long it's gonna happen and so on and we're gonna talk about that also today this is gonna be a huge video so sit back relax and chill and uh, watch for the time codes in a in a video if you don't want to watch something you just switch to the time code okay so let's go The story of current reset started in 20, uh, 2009 when Hillary Clinton tried to push the reset button in government relationships, so called government relationship. But literally, what they did, they started the new project, the reset project. And it's not only uh, what she was uh, doing in 2009, she was also trying to start it in 2016 when she was talking about it after her loss in the presidential elections. And during the elections, she was also pushing on Russia. So something worked wrong. Two years after Russia and the United States pressed the symbolic reset button in their relations, Vice President Joe Biden is now in Moscow. He's already met the Russian President Dmitry Medvedev. Artisa Katerina Grachova is following the events and joins me live from central Moscow with more. Hello, Katerina. So Biden's visit is aimed at upgrading this reset between the U.S. and Russia. How are they going about that? Well, indeed, it looks like this visit looks like an attempt to expand into new dimensions of this reset. Yeah, after Hillary uh, failed in the reset, Sleepy Joe came to Russia. He wasn't that sleepy back then. He was trying to revive this uh, reset deal and so on. Biden also failed to to in establish new level of relationships, as the media said, and so he also started hating Russia and so on. And he was back in Hillary and back in this idea of Russian collusion and so on. And right now he's also angry at Russia. Something went wrong in 2011. After he left, Russian opposition started to kick out. Uh, new, you know, re rebellion and coup attempts and trying to take out Putin and Medvedev and so on. But that didn't, didn't work in 2011. What we want to do in Davos this year in this respect is to push the reset button. Let me explain. The world is much too much still caught in a crisis management mode. And we forget that we should take now into our hands uh, and we should look for solutions for the really fundamental issues. We should look at our future in a much more constructive, in a much more strategic way. And that's what Davos is about. So the globalists started it the reset talks uh, via World Economic Forum amid the lack of success in political field, and the globalists started to act. Willem Midkoop, um, our middle coop, he's the author of The Big Reset, The War on Gold and the Financial Endgame. He believes that the international monetary system has entered its last term and is up for reset. I want to say it's Harry Dent. Is it Harry Dent or is that a comic book? Right. That's the comic book guy, right? Harry Dent? Yes. That's Two-Face, Harry Dent. I think there's another Harry Dent, a real guy. Will you look him up? He's a financial guy. I think he was the guy who predicted the crash of 2008 or something. He's a really good guy. He says, we are already at the beginning of the crash. 
He says it's already beginning to happen. Nobody That's realizes it, but it's already here. It is Harry Esther. Okay, so this guy, Willem Middlecoop, he said, quote, it always ends in inflation, and certainly in 2016, we can expect more quantitative easing. When that doesn't defeat deflation, further unorthodox measures will be taken, helicopter money, and eventually a gold revaluation. By revaluing gold to a much higher level, I'm quoting him, to over $8,000 an ounce, central bankers will solve quite a lot of problems, end quote. Wow. If that it's happens, twelve hundred now. Yeah, it's eleven hundred. Eleven hundred. Yeah, it's, it might go up to eight thousand. That that's that's crazy. That's crazy. Now this is one guy's opinion, but he's a pretty respected guy. But one guy's opinion. I don't buy it for investment. I buy it but if it's at eight thousand dollars an ounce. The world is in crazy town. The world is absolutely on fire. But that's what these experts are now starting to say. When I started saying this originally, nobody was saying it. Remember? Oh, yeah. Nobody was saying it. Now all the experts are starting to say, we are headed for something much, much worse than 2008. The big reset is coming. And here we are where this, you know, great reset is like a pushing plan for a post-COVID world and so on. And everybody is hyping on it and everybody's trying to interview, make interviews on that. While all this crazy stuff uh, is going around, we, we still see the, the, the perspective of this uh, technology and um, they can actually implement it right now. Of the most severe crisis, the world has experienced since World War II. 75 years ago, countries and people came together to shape the post-war global order, which brought us decades of peace, increased global cooperation and prosperity to hundreds of millions of people around the world. The COVID-19 crisis has shown us that our old systems are not fit anymore for the 21st century. It has laid bare the fundamental lack of social cohesion, fairness, inclusion, and equality. Now is the historical moment, the time, not only to fight severe virus, but to shape the system for the need for the post-corona era. We have a choice to remain passive, which would lead to, an, to the amplification of many of the trends we see today. Polarization, nationalism, racism, and ultimately increased social unrest and conflicts. But we have another choice. We can build a new social contract, particularly integrating the next generation we can change our behavior to be in harmony with nature again. And we can make sure that the technologies of the fourth industrial revolution are best utilized to provide us with better lives. In short, we need a great reset. It's not a conspiracy theory. It is factually accurate. Watch this video from September. You may not have seen it. It wasn't played much in this country. This is the Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau, speaking to the United Nations. This pandemic has provided an opportunity for a reset. This is our chance to accelerate our pre-pandemic efforts to reimagine economic systems that actually address global challenges like extreme poverty, inequality, and climate change. Oh, this is our chance, says Justin Trudeau. Not our chance to save you from a virus with a 99% survival rate, You'll almost certainly be fine, and they're fully aware of that. This is our chance to impose totally unprecedented social controls on the population in order to bypass democracy and change everything to conform with their weird academic theories that have never been tested in the real world and, by the way, don't actually make sense. This is their chance. Quote, this pandemic has provided an opportunity for a reset, end quote. Keep in mind, that's not from QAnon. That is a head of state talking. And he's not alone. Klaus Schwab is the founder of the World Economic Forum. Schwab has written a book called COVID-19, The Great Reset. The book isn't really about science or medicine, no. Instead, it describes, quote, 
What changes will be needed to create a more inclusive, resilient, and sustainable world going forward? End quote. What changes is Schwab talking about? We don't know. What we're certain of is that you're going to pay for them, and the people in charge will benefit from them. You can bet on that. There are some people out there right now who believe that the coronavirus pandemic is part of an actual plan to reset the whole world society so that we slow things down a little and stop consuming so much so that the planet doesn't burn up in a climate change nightmare. They're calling it the Great Reset. Now, I'm not saying I believe this necessarily is going on, but the World Economic Forum and Justin Trudeau certainly aren't doing anything to stop the idea from floating around. The World Economic Forum is this fancy group of billionaires who all get together every year in Davos, Switzerland, where they plan out the global economy for us peons. Really, it's for our own good. It's not just to make them richer or anything. And after Trump won the election back in 2016, they tweeted out a pretty crazy message. They tweeted, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. This is how our world could change by 2030. Read more. And then that linked to a page on the Canadian government's website, which had a video on it that was all about how you'll own nothing and you'll be happy, damn it, because that's the plan they have for us all. Which sounds a lot like the Great Reset, actually. Which is probably why the tweet and the webpage have now been taken down, according to Rebel News, who scooped up a cached version of it to prove it existed. So, on the one hand, you've got the World Economic Forum deleting stuff that sure as hell sounds like the Great Reset. And then on the other, you've got Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau now coming out and saying that the coronavirus pandemic has provided an opportunity for a reset. <laughs> I mean, he's using the actual word, reset. This is not the best way to go about convincing people that there's no Great Reset going on, that's for sure. So. You got that? The global elites of the planet don't want us to have anything anymore because it's all bad for the environment. They want us to own nothing. And what's more, they demand we be happy about it. Anyway, who knows if there's a planned great reset going on right now. All I know for sure is the billionaires who sold us a bunch of crap and built the consumerist economy that got us into this mess surely shouldn't be the ones telling us what we should or shouldn't do about it now. And they sure as hell shouldn't be the ones who get to tell us how to be happy. Because of the shock that everyone has been through with the global pandemic taking us into a completely different whole of world economic shock in a way that we've not really seen for a very, very long time, that has focused minds on how important it is to treat these big systemic threats like climate change as real. And whereas before they were kind of a theoretical thing that might happen sometime in the future. Where's your optimism? Where's your hope for the future gone? Like, what is actually wrong with building back better? Like, why can't we learn from this experience and take a step forward as a species, you know, for humankind? What is wrong with tackling inequality? What is wrong with ending poverty? What is wrong with getting on top of climate change? Like, these are the That's... things that humankind should be aspiring to. <laughs> do it. Watch the Great Reset video that the World Economic Forum has put out. It's uh, freely available. It's under their logo. They say uh, that by 2030, they don't want anyone to own property. You'll own no property and you'll be happier, apparently. Uh, you'll, you'll, be, you'll be happy because you're told to be happy. So, Nick, send all your property up to me. Uh... Rita, um, I think that the Great Reset, Build Back Better, it's the economic BLM, right? It is the, uh, the Trojan horse where the, uh, the bumper sticker is great, but there's an awful lot of nasty in there. Oh, absolutely. All the stuff that Nicholas said, uh, none of it is going to be achieved by the policies they're advocating. It's absolutely a cynical exercise to use a tragedy, to use a pandemic, a crisis to further their political agenda, which they've always had. This political agenda wasn't born because of this crisis. It wasn't some moment where they, they thought, oh, we can do things better. This is what they have been pushing for for decades. And they're trying to uh, use this uh, moment, this uh, uh, incredible moment in history to, to, to advance that cause. Now is the time to think what history would say about this crisis. And now is the time for all of us to define our own role. Will history say that was the great reversal 
and we actually today see very worrisome, worrisome uh, signs. Uh, 170 countries are going to uh, finish this year with a smaller economy than they started. And we already project that uh, there will be more debt, more deficit, more unemployment, and there is a very high risk of more inequality and more poverty unless we act. And that takes me to what is it that would make it so that history would look at this crisis as the great opportunity for reset. Billions of people around the world in many countries have benefited from globalization, but not all the people in all countries and not all countries either. Globalization brought prosperity and further inequality at the same moment. Due to unemployment, we risk increased inequality within countries, hitting the weakest the hardest. There's also a risk of inequality growing between countries. Despite much progress, the developing world can be hit harder by COVID-19 than the developed world. And later, or a more limited access to vaccines would exasperate this problem. For economic response, we can find inspiration in the Marshall Plan, which was developed by the United States nearly 75 years ago in the wake of World War II. Not as a favor to Europe, but to help the continent recover after they, together with the Canadians and British, liberated Europe. We can learn from the leadership shown in that period and will create multilateralism. After all, the United Nations was founded for this. There's something similar we in the West can now do for developing countries, especially in Africa. Increase resilience, help the recovery, ensure people have an economic future. We must invest now. These investments, not aid, should be directed towards increasing self-sufficiency through improved food systems, blah, blah, blah. The second is climate change. We should be careful we don't postpone the actions to combat climate change. Unlike COVID-19, we can't say in a few years that we didn't see climate change coming. <laughs> the Paris Treaty has demonstrated that at least we were aware. This critical question now is how we can take more faster action with more emphasis on sustainability and circularity. What the hell is circulator? Then the third one, and you're going to love this one, a change in capitalism. What? The focus should shift from short term and profit only to longer term, incorporating value creation for people and the planet, moving from shareholder value to stakeholder value. <laughs> With the economy in a recession, it is tempting to look to short term profits by declaring cash is king and postponing investments. That applies to both countries and companies. However, it would be wise if countries would spend on re building the economy and investing in new technologies to stimulate the fourth industrial revolution, investing in a better future. Long-term investments are needed from companies too, and it requires leadership and guts as there will be many temptations to focus on the short term. Our longer term economic strategy should remain anchored in addressing the sustainable development goals. Oh, that's agenda 21. And we should not lose sight of those. Oh, man, this is great. So what we're going to do is instead of just going back and getting back into, you know, work and doing the things that we do best. No, no, no. Now we're going to have a global governance that wants to take care of these three things. They're going to take care of, of you know, uh, inequality, making sure everybody is equal. Uh, then they're going to take care of climate change and reinvent capitalism. At least first two points are uh, highly related to Biden. He is all for equality and all these BLMs and uh, although he didn't said last time he doesn't support them but literally he was supporting them by not saying anything while looting, uh, looting was going on the whole country was teared apart and burned on fire. So. Biden also was talking about climate change at the debates and trying to poke uh, Trump with climate change and all this stuff. So, recalling that case from uh, 2011 when he was in Russia with this uh, reset and building on reset uh, titles that he was trying to talk, Obama sent him. 
and uh, all his stuff that was he was doing in Ukraine, like corruption and all this stuff, where he also participated big time. I think they wanted to reset and uh, build upon Russia, and uh, so right now this stuff is not working. Russia is not cooperating, and uh, pl plenty of uh, people doesn't support that stuff in Russia. So. Uh, he's backed by the liberals, he's backed by the BLM, he's backed by the socialists and uh, Harris wasn't uh, that simple and she's also gonna continue whatever Biden started and didn't do and uh, she will be able to finish this stuff as she thinks but this is not yet over for this election as I was saying Trump was scripted to win and they're celebrating too early. Check out how the American dream evolves from the mid 1950s when Ralph and Alice Cramden live in a rundown tenement. <laughs> Leave it to Beaver. Just a half decade later, the Cleavers have a nice suburban home. Well, Mom, that's the way we all became the Brady Bunch. By the 70s, the Bradys have an even fancier one. Even more luxury in the 80s with the Ewings of Dallas playing out their dramas in a mansion. Fast forward to this decade and life is downright decadent on shows like Gossip Girl. The boom grossed me out. You know, Hummerville and Conspicuous Consumptionville, just, I never liked it. Professor Richard Florida of the University of Toronto says we are now in the middle of what he calls the Great Reset, a time when our entire way of life will be reimagined. So do you think the American dream in some ways has been perverted in the last decade or so? I think you're right. And I think many, many Americans felt that they were on this kind of treadmill and couldn't keep up and actually felt empty. Hi, we're the Berkleys from San Diego, California. Holly and Keith Berkeley were definitely on that treadmill. During the boom, Holly's internet marketing consulting company was thriving. She was driven, she says, to the extreme. With both of my boys, I only took one day off after giving birth. What? I only took one day off and I thought that that was what you're supposed to do. That's how you get successful. We're going to do a double bullnose cap right here. Keith was in overdrive too, his contracting business doubling in size every year. It sounds like you guys were living pretty large for a while. We did. We upgraded to this house, bought it at the, the top of the market. We uh, bought the big luxury SUV, three flat screen TVs. They even traveled the world going to U2 concerts. Did you think twice before spending or if you wanted something, did you just Oh, no. Get it. Yeah, you just got it. The country is officially declared to be in recession. Then Hope came the crash, the and the Berkeley's American dream started to crumble. I went through a period of time for about four months at the beginning of this year where I didn't bring home any money. The Berkeley's had to make some radical changes. Gym memberships canceled, replaced by neighborhood runs. That SUV sold. Trips to the amusement park with the kids, replaced by trips to the backyard. You fired the gardener. You yeah. cut off the cable, even though you have three big screen TVs. Three big three TVs, uh-huh. <laughs> but here's the surprising part. The Berkleys say the changes they've had to make, growing their own vegetables. Looks good. You can make a salad. Cooking meals at home instead of going out, and having dinner at the dining room table, not in front of the TV. All of these changes have made their lives better. You actually think your life is better now during the recession? I think that the recession forced us to reevaluate what's important in life. Look what daddy got. What is that? That's a beat. You grew it. I grew it. <laughs> How do you think now that you would define American dream given what you've gone through? It's really about balance. For me, uh, the American dream is to be able to have the best of both worlds, the career and the family, and, and to be present in, in both, and just really enjoying each moment. You know, the kids don't need to be entertained all the time with all this other stuff. They just, they just want to be with you. 
I think what's good about a reset is its period of introspection. You actually have to think about how you're going to organize your family life. And we know spending time together, eating meals together regularly, are what create true happiness and actually create well-developed, well-rounded kids. Some believe this recession will improve all of our lives by bringing us back to the original vision of the American dream, first spelled out in 1931 by author James Truslow Adams, who describes that dream of a land in which life should be better and richer and fuller for every man. The American dream still uh, exists and is beautiful, dynamic, and important. Maybe we're saying the fruits of the dream are changing a little bit. Wall Street Journal columnist Peggy Noonan envisions an America less fixated on designer labels and designer pets. One of the things you write is, people will be allowed to grow old again. There will be fewer facelifts and brow lifts, less Botox, less dyed hair. Mature people will be allowed to look mature. Elderly people will be allowed to look elderly. We may change how and where we live too. Suburban sprawl and fallacious commutes out, in, smaller, more energy efficient homes closer to town and city centers. Many experts paint a romantic post-recession vision where we'll all live like the Berkeleys, where money and status are less important. You talk about life being better at the other end of this economic turmoil, but are you putting lipstick on a pig here? I mean, isn't this just painful and that's it? Resets are really painful. It's horrible. But looking back through American history, these painful, terrible resets have always led to a much better way of life. Great Depression of 1929 and the 1930s, uh, and then the long de panic and long depression of 1873, and also try to take a look at some trends and tendencies, emergent patterns in our current society uh, that, that may augur in or may help us understand the kind of economic event we are going through uh, and what it might take over the long haul to recover and engage a new age of prosperity. Is this is the most dramatic and fundamental economic change in modern economic life. This is a big and fundamental transformation that lots of people have their arms around but many others want to neglect or ignore and that when there are big and fundamental economic transformations like the current one, they typically produce crises. Uh, Joseph Schumpeter wrote about that. People like Hyman Minsky wrote about that. Karl Marx taught us a lot about that. They typically produce very deep crises. Yes, there is all kinds of epiphenomenal reasons for that. The banks get involved in speculative lending. Developers take on too much risk. People take on too much debt. But the real underlying reason for crises and the only route to recovery is an understanding that we have not built the fundamental social, economic, and geographic underpinnings that are required for a new prosperity. So this was way, way back in 2009, in 2010, and he was trying to uh, tell us about his book, The Great Reset, and so on, and he was trying to, uh, you know, distinguish it what it is and protect this definition and so on so he was trying to prove that this theory is working he is from science and this is no conspiracy theory let's listen to him more the money went flowing into speculative endeavor it went back from clicks to bricks to bricks and mortar to real estate there was a huge run up in housing prices and land inflation and we got to the present moment over the past 50 years, we saw the theory of the post-industrial economies. Dan Bell wrote eloquently and powerfully on the rise of post-industrial economies. The rise of services, supplanting manufacturing as a key form of employment. The new economy, the internet economy, the technology economy, the information economy, and of course, in the classic and seminal writings of Fritz Malchup and Peter Drucker, the most powerful theory of all the rise of a knowledge economy. And for the first time, human creativity, which always played in the background as entrepreneurs seized on new means of production, as people developed new ways of farming, as economies and manufacturing took on new forms and we invented assembly lines and scientific management, that human creativity has come front and center. That is what we are dealing with. So he's selling us creativity as the main human resource uh, but creativity is uh, 
always goes with the person. You cannot sell creativity without the person. We have inherited an economy and a set of institutions, management principles, a way of life, which at every level reflects the old industrial order. And that industrial order has been collapsing before our very eyes for the past 50 years. The housing auto energy complex was the pinnacle, the fundamental driver, the fundamental social and economic and spatial underpinnings of the mass production industrial order that is collapsing all around us. This economic and social transformation to human intelligence, to knowledge and creativity is more dramatic than any economic transformation that ever happened before. Now think about how painful they were. I bet it was more painful than it writing this book for you. Think about the things William Blake wrote about when he wrote about laboring in the satanic mills. Think about the challenge Marx and Engels wrote in the Communist Manifesto. Think about the fundamental economic crises, two world-encompassing depressions, major world wars, and this economic transformation, I would submit, is a more fundamental break with the past than any of those others. Now, I don't want to bore you with too many statistics, but I do want to give you a few which will enable you to understand the magnitude and scope of the transformation we have gone through. In the year 1900, more than 50% of Americans worked on farms. A growing number of us worked in factories. Less than 5% of us worked in the knowledge professional and what I call the creative industries. That science, technology, research, development, entrepreneurship, management, the professions, arts, media, entertainment, and design. By the year 1950, we had become a manufacturing economy. Less than 5% of us now worked in agriculture. More than 50% of us worked in or around the factory, the industrial economy. Less than 10% of us worked in the creative economy. Beginning in the year 1980, our economy begins to undergo this transformation. Between 1980 and today, the U.S. economy generated 20 million jobs in the creative sector of the economy. Science, technology, management, law, healthcare, arts, entertainment, media, and design. Today, more than a third of the workforce is employed in these fields. In some of our biggest cities and metros, it's more than 40%. Less than 10% of Americans work in direct production occupations. 22% of us work in blue-collar work broadly, which includes construction and transportation, moving and logistics. 1% of us work in agriculture. That's pretty good time to start the Great Reset, is what he thinks. There's nobody working in, cre in, in the real sector, in agriculture. Who's going to feed all these creative people, right, if the real crisis strikes? And this made-up statistics is definitely showing us that this Great Reset theory wouldn't be very good for all these people. Over the course of the next decade, we will generate another seven and a half million jobs in the knowledge, professional, and creative sector of the economy. Those jobs already account for 50% of all wages and salaries paid. These jobs are the driving economic force of our time. And we have to understand their dynamics and how to harness them. Yeah, how can we harness all these creative and smart people if we are so stupid? Creativity doesn't care if you're a boy or a girl. It doesn't know about gender. It doesn't know about race or ethnicity. It doesn't know about sexual orientation. 50% of those high-tech businesses in Silicon Valley were founded by a foreign-born inventor. In fact, in a book I wrote called Flight of the Creative Class, I said this is the true genius of the American economy. It's not a big market or low-cost production or any of this other stuff. It's the fact that the United States always attracted the best and the brightest. And those regions and communities that could do that in the United States and around the world gain economic advantage. Well, when we found, of course, that regions with a higher concentration of employed artists and musicians and designers and entertainers, and we gave it a funny name, just to have fun with some of my academic colleagues, sorry, we called it the Bohemian Factor. And then when we found that places with a larger concentration of gay and lesbian people had higher rates of innovation and higher rates of, in uh, of income, the gay index. Bohemian factor, gay factor, equality, creativity, and all this stuff. 
This is the point number one from DeVos, equality, equal rights, all this stuff that happened between 2010 and 2020 is big time about race and equality. You see, when you hear the rise of a knowledge and technology-driven economy, internet economy, information age, a technology-driven world, the first thing that people conclude is that, oh, that means geography isn't important anymore. With all this technology and wireless and iPhones and Blackberries and mobile devices, I taught at Carnegie Mellon for 20 years. Our motto was anytime, any place, anywhere. The death of distance. Geography doesn't matter. Everybody, right, you saw the ads, everybody was going to sit by that hillside with their mobile device, typing in and telecommuting from wherever they want. The world is flat. In a flat world, six billion people can plug in and communicate and commute from wherever they are. Yeah, all this distance and remote jobs and education that we experienced in 2020, and that's what he was talking about. Yeah, definitely this sector is rising and all these Zooms and Skypes and chats via internet and all these technologies raised big time right now. Much more powerful counterforce. Why can't people see it? Why don't we have a conversation about it? Why is that conversation only emerging now? The much more important counterforce was the role of inward movement, the role of geographic concentration and agglomeration. I, I submit to you, and I'd like you to reflect on this, that place and community, that geographic place, has become the central social and economic organizing mechanism of our time. Remember I was talking about capitals and capitalism, which is literally concentrating human resources in uh, certain areas, like big cities. Right now he's talking about it, and he also, you know, pretends to, you know, reveal all this uh, hidden uh, information, hidden uh, predictions that's gonna happen pretty much soon, okay? Just take a look at what he's trying to tell us. That our geographic place, our communities, our cities, our metropolitan areas, our mega regions have replaced the industrial corporation as the key mechanism of organizing our economic and social life, of matching people to jobs. My dad had one job for life from age 13 to age 65. The average American changes jobs once every three years. The average American under age 30 changes jobs once a year. Adam Smith had a really great theory. He called it the division of labor and efficiency. And with that theory, he said in his pin factory, his famous pin factory, you could go on and make stuff more efficiently and, 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 and drive costs down and more effectively and drive productivity out in a company. She said, that's a great theory of making things cheaper. She said, but the theory we really need is a theory of where new things come from. That doesn't come from a company. That comes from a city. A city is the place you can mix and match people, where talented and ambitious people come, not necessarily with college degrees. Many of our entrepreneurs are college dropouts. They come to a city to find others, even unwittingly, and lever their talents, create leverage all around themselves. That's what Silicon Valley is, that's what New York City is, that's what Nashville is for music. But everyone cannot be musician or, I don't know, architecture or designer or painter. Somebody has to feed all those people. And Cities are incubators of in innovation. They create a spatial division of labor. Diverse, open-minded cities are our key economic drivers. I summarize this in the book as the three T's. Technology, talent, and tolerance. What I think is going to happen next in this great reset, what I think we're up against with all of this backgrounding that you've just heard, the rise of the creative economy, the importance of diversity, and the importance of place and community and city. We have built a powerful economic infrastructure. We have created the potential for productivity increases and technological innovation that people like my parents, my grandparents with no education, could have scantily even dreamed about in futuristic uh, projections. But of course, that's all broken down. We have unemployment rates that's bobbling in the mid-9%. 
The real unemployment rate is probably 15, 16, 17, 18 percent, and Dave Bing, the new mayor of Detroit, has said in the inner city of Detroit, he believes the real unemployment rate is 50 percent. We have unemployment rates of 25 percent or higher for people who work in construction, 15 percent of higher for blue collar people, uh, and it doesn't look like it's getting better. Our housing market is stuck in the mud, no matter how much money we throw at it. The Eurozone is in terrible shape, and anyone who even bothers, who has the stomach to look at our deficit numbers, uh, gets terrified. So what do we need to do? Our quick fixes didn't work. Our attempt to throw money at the problem and stimulate our economy out of it didn't work. Our monetary policy innovations didn't work either. Yes, they have stabilized and caused us to get past the worst. But they have improved the foundation for growth. We're wasting, sorry, Ram, we're wasting the crisis. Now, what do we need to do or think about to get out of this? We need to keep our eye on the ball. We need to build a real social, economic, and geographic underpinning that can move our economy forward. I learned about this in the Great Reset when I did the research. I learned three things that happened during these periods. During these, these aren't just depression periods or recession periods or crisis periods. These are periods when we reset our lives, when financial reality sets in, when millions and millions of people begin to behave differently. The first thing I learned are these are very long-term processes. Anyone who thinks we're out of the woods on this needs to take a long look at the numbers. This guy quite an optimist. He, he thinks we are still in the woods. I don't think we are in the woods anymore. We are in a big, big swamp. But anyways, take a look how many terms does he use. A flat world, a great reset, housing markets stuck in the mud, and uh, many, many more. Write me in the comments, what else did you hear, hear from him that correlates to my research? Same thing happened in the 1870s. It took three decades to reset the economy. Second thing I learned is that government spending is an important enabler, but it can't solve the problem. And the third thing I learned is that individual technological innovations, these are the most individually technologically innovative periods, the 1870s and 80s and 1930s were the two most innovative decades. They blow away the 1990s in terms of innovation, but it's not just individual innovations, it's new systems of innovation. What powers economic recovery over and above all of those is something no one ever talks about except a small clique of geographers. They call it the spatial fix. The spatial fix. It's not the technological fix that powers our way out of recession and depression. What they argue, it's the spatial fix. I'll make this real simple. It wasn't just New Deal spending that helped us get out of the Depression. It wasn't just World War II mobilization that helped us recover from the economic crisis. There was something that was more important than any of them. The rise of suburbia. The suburban way of life. That's the nature of the shift. The suburban way of life, the combination of houses and roads, spurred the demand for all of those products of the assembly line. It worked perfectly for the old order. It doesn't work perfectly anymore. We need a dramatic break with the housing energy auto complex. Why? Not because sprawl is a bad thing. Not because suburban houses are silly or tacky or people don't like them. That's all nonsense. Because if we're going to open up spending and create demand for the new industries that are going to power our future, if we're going to invest in new technology-based industries and new energy and personal and human development, skill development, where's that money going to come from? Why did Americans go into so much debt in the first place? We were massively over-consuming the fundamental goods of the old order, housing and energy and cars. The average American spends over 55% of their income on housing, cars, and energy. Add in education and health care, food, and what's left over. Herbert Hoover had a great phrase. You might not lurk Herbert Hoover. A chicken in every pot and a car in every garage. Before a car could go into every garage, agricultural had to become effective, efficient, and cheap. Before we can build an economy of the future on creativity and knowledge and productivity, we've got to make housing and energy and cars cheap. And what the book The Great Reset talks about is how that is happening now. How we can already see the beginnings of that trend. 
as empty nesters abandon their McMansions and move back to smaller units, as young people postpone buying a house, as our cultural fetish for cars begins to diminish. Everyone from Nate Silver to many others are showing the decline in cars at a status symbol. As millions upon millions of Americans slowly but surely begin to reset the way we live. Forget about cars, forget about big houses, forget about everything. You, you're gonna be riding bikes, walking, running or whatever, you know, maybe scooter or something, electric car, maybe if you're rich enough. And that's it. That's all they got for, for us, guys. Remember, this is coming up. We are generating massive new mega regions. It's not city versus suburb anymore. That's a mistaken debate. It's city and suburb. The intensification and increased density and concentration. Look at the greater Washington, D.C. area. It's, of course, the rebuilding of the district, but Bethesda and Arlington, the remaking of Tyson's Corner as a more walkable, human. 60% of Americans say they want to live in a walkable neighborhood. These massive mega regions, like the New York, Boston, Washington, Carter, the Denver, Boulder area, Northern California, Southern California, where I live, the area that goes from Toronto to Buffalo to Rochester, 40 of these mega regions worldwide house less than 18% of our people. They produce two thirds of our output and nine in 10 of our innovations. We're going to have to make them bigger and stronger and more economically integrated. We're going to need better forms of transportation. High speed rail is one, and we can talk about it. We're going to have to tilt the balance away from home ownership, and it's something I've been writing a great deal about. Home ownership was the fundamental economic driver of post-war prosperity. It underpinned, it was the major economic and social and geographic underpinning. It no longer powers growth, it puts people in the poor house, it distorts our economy, it deflects resources where they can be better used. We found in our research that already 36 million Americans rent and more and more are doing so every day. In the most flexible and vibrant and innovative communities across this country, uh, our high point in home ownership was 70%. It's falling drastically as a result of the crisis. It's now down to about 66%. The Urban Land Institute predicts it'll be 62%, but in the most innovative communities in our country, whether that's Silicon Valley or LA and Entertainment or New York, 50 to 55% of people own their homes. We have to tilt back home ownership from where it was. And in the less innovative, the stodgiest, the most economically depressed communities, 80% of people own their homes. We need to invest in an infrastructure of the future, not an infrastructure of the past. Every great, re great reset has seen, seen the way we house Americans and organize our cities shift. We need to build an economy and a set of economic underpinnings. We need to take a set of public investments and invest them in the future. Well, uh, as a professor, you know I come from the Fidel Castro School of Public Speaking, so I could talk about this all day. Fidel Castro School, <laughs> that's why he is so socialist and, you know, <laughs> trained the leftists, I would say. And, um, well, that shows us everything. And remember, he was talking about housing, like, you know, using it more efficient and all this efficiency and efficiency. That's what we had during the previous resets. Then we, they were using old houses for housing new people and just rebuilding the tops of the houses, not excavating them. So we're dealing with multi-locational people. Technology gives us that. But the other thing it does is it probably makes your location choice much more important to you. When you can choose, when you don't have to just go where the jobs are, where the ports are, where the resources are, where you have some low flexibility in picking location, people get to pick the locations they want to be in. And they not only pick beautiful locations. And this is where everyone gets this confused. They not only pick beautiful and open-minded locations, what people are looking for more and more is locational leverage, locational premiums. They want locations, that's why this festival is so interesting at so many levels to me. It's a way of creating real locational leverage around ideas. And so when people are picking locations, they're looking for whatever locational leverage they can get out of them. And that's why I wrote Who's Your City? We're and people need advice on this. People need advice on how to best pick their locations, and furthermore, not only from the community side, locational choices will change over the course of your life cycle. So what fits us as a person when we're young and single right out of college, where I think go to the biggest city you can, optimize your earnings. We already know what the earnings premium in big cities like New York are for college kids. It makes no sense to try to minimize because you take that earnings premium with you. Then when you have kids, you can make another set of location decisions. And when you're an empty nester, still a third set of location decisions. But I think locational flexibility doesn't mean location becomes less important. It actually 
means that people will become much more selective in picking the locations they do choose to live in. So this is the, his imaginary world where people can really pick and choose the locations and do it, you know, very smart and so on. But in, in our world, in current world, it doesn't work. So he wants everybody to be single and doesn't have any kids to realize it's working. How do we maintain income levels in a flat world where people who are used to making $80,000 for certain jobs that can be outsourced to the rest of the world uh, can be outsourced to equally qualified people who can deliver that same product at substantially lower prices? The classic collective action problem. And it's the collective action problem Keynes thought about, Alvin Hansen thought about, and Franklin Roosevelt thought about. The classic collective action problem that's confronted this country time and time and time again. How do we keep incomes up? How do we create demand? And now it's worse. It's not only worse because it's global spreading. That's one aspect which you hit on. We have the highest levels not only of personal, individual income inequality, that's now compounded geographically. I've just looked at the data. When you look at the data separating income levels in the most advanced cities, the most prosperous cities, from those at the bottoms, when you look at levels of skill and education, this country is becoming ripped apart. And then within our most prosperous cities, levels of in income inequality we have never seen before. So we not only have a class society, overlaid on top of that now we have an economic geography of class. Guess what that gives us? Red and blue and angry. This isn't about a red and blue political thing. This is a class. This is a quiet class war. That's what we got on our hands, a quiet class war going on. How do we solve it? I, I think there's only one way. We've got to push up the bottom. We can't cut off the peaks. We have to push up the bottom. We have to make service jobs good jobs. That's all we got. We have to make low-skilled jobs like my dad did with a seventh grade education. We have to make them good jobs. The only way we're going to make them good jobs is to increase their productivity and innovation. That's why I called on the president and his administration to convene a summit immediately. That in some of our cities, we've seen almost complete rebirth. And in other cities, the hole in the donut has gotten larger. And Detroit now, the idea is to clear it and farm it. Uh, it, it's just so remarkable to me. So, but most people look at one or the other, but forget that they're both going on. This is just an indication of the level of spatial and geographic inequality we have. He also classifies society and like red and blue, like red, uh, just the, 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 the hugest part of the country is red and uh, small is blue. It's not a political thing, is what he thinks. But literally, we saw at these elections, but that the whole map of U.S. is red and and uh, just the city areas are majorly blue. Even in those states that were democratic, the prevalent uh, vote rate was in the cities and the rural areas was always red. The kinds of things that you've been talking about create not just, as you put it, innovation, but also, in essence, a competitive edge. Um, now, if you look around the world, who is getting it, what you're saying? Who is getting it perhaps faster than we are getting it? Well, you know, I, I, I'm a pretty good sense of this because I get to travel all around the world. I, I think every one of you needs to come to Toronto. I think you need to take a look at Toronto. I mean, I thought I knew Toronto. I really did. I thought I knew the city and, until we moved there. I knew like the downtown core and the entertainment district and the university. I didn't realize that, that there was what I called an urban family land when I had to rewrite Who's Your City? that not just high income people who can afford private schools, every income group can live in the downtown of Toronto within a mile or two miles, and some choose to live further out, if they choose to and send their kids to good schools, where there's health care provided so people don't have to sweat about that, where most of the great universities are right part and, and, and technical schools are part of the downtown, where the suburbs are manically and frantically trying to reinvent, where they're trying to attract people who used to come to the United States, Vancouver, Sydney, Melbourne, all of Northern Europe, all of Northern Europe, the great cities of Northern Europe. And, and, I do, and then, of course, the emerging cities in China and India for whatever they're doing. I do think the competition is fiercer. And I do believe that that's a good thing. That's going to cause lots of people to wake up and say, well, we have to get with this competition and, and do better. But the key to success is very simple. Which of those cities and communities will harness the fuller-blown creativity of their population? 
Just like on the factory floor, the companies that began to harness more and more of worker intelligence and knowledge got a competitive edge. The communities that break with this divide, that can, you know, my new model is those who waste less win. Those who waste the least win. Whether it's human resources or environmental resources, so those communities that can do that over time will get that competitive edge. Whoever is wasting or wasting less is just the, the case of these current topic about cities or corporations but in in both cases cities or corporations all the waste we are going to be paying them back it's remaking our suburbs that's where the construction is the shoddiest that's where the buildings are the least and, and the infrastructure is the most weakly built so i think it's a, a large renewal project and what I, i talk about this in the great reset the programs that really excite me are suburban rebuilding the rebuilding of Tyson's Corner, the classic edge city, the, the transformation of Arlington, Virginia, the incredible transformation of the older suburbs around Toronto as they, as they try to attract foreign-born people and create density, walkability, transit hubs. The work in Prince George's County in Maryland by the African-American leadership to remake Prince George's County as a more creative, walkable, pedestrian, friendly. So that's enormous. I do think, though, we can give the big box uh, developers more credit than we think. From Best Buy to Target to even I would submit Walmart, they can all begin to understand the need to create a different kind of floor plate. A big box store is really just a set of stores. There's an electronic shop and a whatever, a digital video and audio shop and a clothing shop and a grocery store. Those things Yes, you get some advantages in laying them out laterally, but those can be laid out laterally in a more urban context. They can take, the, and that's happening. And some of the most far-sighted urban planners, we did this in, in Pittsburgh, in the East Liberty neighborhood, some of the most far-sighted urban planners are saying, that's a way we can work together. One of the things we learned in Pittsburgh with our disdain for the big box, right, because we were the urbanists, we wanted mom and pop shops, we wanted local stores, what did the lower income residents of the neighborhood say? We want jobs and we want cheap stuff. Yeah, you can have all your yuppie goods. You can have your organic whatnot. We want jobs and we want cheap stuff, right? We want what you get. And, and so we began to develop a plan and community leaders, community development leaders began to develop a plan of how to create a more urban version. Now, they weren't able to convince the conventional big box, but they did a remarkable job of convincing Whole Foods. And the whole food store they achieved employing local residents and also providing a, a wider mix of projects was incredible. Now that's an enlightened employer, but it can and should be done. And I think that's where urban development and urban, urban planning pressure can be applied to some ends. So first there were quarantines and lockdowns and the, the, the business on the streets was dying. Then it was looting. Then it can be anything again because those like lockdowns and the, the economic depression will continue. So small businesses won't survive, and the big box businesses are gonna conquer the streets. What would be your vision for the role that financial institutions should be playing in this reset, particularly those that used to make a lot of their money from mortgages uh, for homeowners? Um. Well, I think, I think that's another reason to come to visit Canada. <laughs> I mean, we were blown away as Americans. Like, we had this thing we thought was a fixed rate mortgage, and, but it's a closed mortgage, which means we can't pay it off early or we have to pay a penalty. We can't just flip and refinance mortgages there. We pay a huge penalty in interest rate. We have a contract with the bank. Uh, banks hold their mortgages. So there are a variety of things we could do right now instead of putting a trillion dollars, a trillion dollars of our money into supporting the flipping and refinancing of mortgages. It's all a government market now. There is no private market. I mean, it's, it's absurd and it's gross. So, and we're gonna have to pay it off. Uh, I think our financial institutions have to become much more like a utility. I really do. Uh, they supply capital, it's a critical function, but it, it's not where the real economy is. We have to figure out a way institutionally to make our financial markets work effectively, sort of like a utility that can supply capital. And, and maybe the other place we need to look is at our great venture capitalists that have in the Silicon Valley and elsewhere put capital to work. But I think right now we have to tilt the balance away from financial mega profits 
and to the real company. I, I... So this dude is definitely not sponsored by any banksters. Uh, I smell Rockefeller's sense and George Soros behind him. So probably uh, all these uh, applications that we have on our iPhones and Androids that can uh, make us invest and pay mobile faster, uh, you know, are the big result of what he was saying back in 2010. We got to dramatically change our education system. We have a creativity squelching machine on our hands that's a, that's a hand-me-down from the industrial age. Every, every great reset this country has gone through has completely remade its educational system, and we forget this. And I just want to, before you go here, Ken, later, I just want to put this preface in. In the 1870s, we created mass public education that gave people basing reading, writing, and arithmetic who were uneducated before, not only native-born Americans, but immigrants. In the New Deal and post-war era, we massively expanded not only high school education to more people, so the kids coming after my dad went to high school, but we massively, through the GI Bill and state funding of education, created higher education that was accessible to all. Schools are not real estate. And we just have to get over this. It's about learning, not putting kids, and I'm going to say this in the most blatant way, in these prisons. We have to break with this mentality that we have to go and punch a clock to get how much learning goes on in those places every day. How much learning actually goes on in that classroom? We have to, with the technology we have, with the communities we have, with increased density, we desperately need a massive, and the effort we need today is going to make the, the invention of public schooling and the invention of the GI Bill look like the most small-scale chicken feed we've ever seen. If I want you guys to remember one thing, is that this is not a typical economic uh, period we're going through. Uh, the run-of-the-mill solutions won't work. We do need a much broader uh, set of thinking and a much bigger reset. And here we have it, remote educational system, a much heavier you know, crisis and an opportunity for a new great reset, a much bigger crisis. That's what he wanted. And it was upcoming, he knew that. He is an ideologist of it. Well, let's take this experience and really learn how we can do differently and better with our education system in terms of technology and virtual education, uh, et cetera. And that's something we're actively working on through this process. So it's not about just reopening schools. When we are reopening schools, let's open a better school and let's open a smarter education system. And I want to thank the Bill and Melinda Gates uh, Foundation. We'll be working with them on this project. Bill Gates uh, is a visionary in many ways, and uh, his ideas and thoughts on technology and education he's spoken about for years. But I think we now have a moment in history where we can actually incorporate and advance those ideas, right? When does change come to a society? Uh, because we all talk about change and advancement, but really we like control, right? And we like the status quo, and it's hard to change the status quo. But you get moments in history where people say, okay, I'm ready. I'm ready for change. I get it. I think this is one of those moments. Everyone is talking about the Great Reset. And some of you are saying, oh, here we go, another conspiracy theory. This is not a conspiracy theory. As a matter of fact, Time Magazine just devoted an entire issue to promoting the Great Reset. I send you my warmest greetings and best wishes on the launch of the Great Reset. The COVID-19 pandemic is causing enormous human suffering and economic hardship. A microscopic virus has closed down entire countries and economies. In doing so, it has exposed the fragility that characterizes much of our world. But this fragility is not confined to health systems, runaway climate change, unsustainable levels of inequality, and the lawlessness of cyberspace are all warning signs that we must heed. The Great Reset is a welcome recognition that this human tragedy must be a wake-up call.
as you rightly say, it is imperative that we reimagine, rebuild, redesign, reinvigorate and rebalance our world. Rebalancing investment, harnessing science and technology, and advancing the transition to net zero emissions, all elements of the Great Reset, are fundamental to building the future we need. We must build more equal, inclusive and sustainable economies and societies that are more resilient in the face of pandemics, climate change and the many other global challenges we face. The global stakeholders, who's that? Is it world leaders? Is it religious leaders? Is it the academics? Is it the elite billionaires? Who is it that we are entrusting to fix the world? I don't mind fixing the world. I don't mind making the world a better place. The question is, who is leading this initiative? Who's making the decisions on how we're going to make the world a better place? We have an incredible opportunity to create entirely new sustainable industries, investing in nature as the true engine of our economy. The current global crisis has disrupted every aspect of our lives, but it has also presented us with an extraordinary opportunity, a chance to reset and accelerate efforts to improve the state of our world. Changing our current trajectory will require bold and imaginative action, together with determination and decisive leadership. In order to secure our future and to prosper, we need to evolve our economic model, putting people and planet at the heart of global value creation. If there is one critical lesson we have to learn from this crisis, we need to put nature at the heart of how we operate. We are on the verge of catalytic breakthroughs that will alter our view of what is possible and profitable within the framework of a sustainable future. We need nothing short of a paradigm shift, one that inspires action at revolutionary levels and pace. We simply cannot waste any more time. The only limit is our willingness to act. And the time to act is now. So now you get it, who is behind it. As I was saying, it's uh, always Corona Crown. All those people from the 18th and 19th century that were performing the reset before. And the scenario is pretty much the same. Empty streets, you know, all those quarantines, lockdowns. Replacing people, education, financial reset, and, uh, you know, governance reset, first of all. So all this stuff is just like what we had back in the days. We have a golden opportunity to seize something good from this crisis. Its unprecedented shockwaves may well make people more receptive to big visions of change. A global crisis like pandemics and climate change know no borders and highlight just how interdependent we are as one people sharing one planet. Over the past month or so, despite the ongoing crisis, I've been encouraged to see the growing calls for a green recovery. We, start, we need only look to the United Nations Secretary General, to the IMF, uh, the EU, the Petersburg Climate Dialogue, the Canadian government, the COP26 Universities Network, and business leaders around the world to see this. And as we move from rescue to recovery, Therefore, we have a unique but rapidly shrinking window of opportunity to learn lessons and reset ourselves on a more sustainable path. It is an opportunity we have never had before and may never have again. So we must use all the levers we have at our disposal, knowing that each and every one of us has a vital role to play. Everything I have tried to do and urge over the past 50 years has been done with our children and grandchildren in mind. 
So I can only encourage us all to think big and act now. Inclusion and equality. Equal, inclusive and sustainable. Sustainable. More inclusive. More inclusive. More inclusive. Financial inclusion. Sustainable. Equal footing. Sustainable. Equal. Sustainably. Sustainable. 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 A more sustainable path. More sustainable and more inclusive. Sustainable. A sustainable economy. Sustainability. More sustainable. Sustainability. Sustainability. Sustainable development goals. Sustainable, more inclusive uh, world.